Most public school students in California are required to complete a mission project while in school. From what I have learned, this usually occurs sometime between the third and fourth grade. On the internet, I found a large number of these projects in video form and would like to share a few of them with you. This report is about Mission San Juan Capistrano by Louis Berger. Quicha is an Indian name for the houses they lived in. A quicha was made out of willow branches and brush. You can see that it is not as nice the rooms the Spaniards had, but the Indians were used to it. They stepped on cook in the quicha, even at the mission. How did the Spaniards get the Indians to leave their simple way of life to live at the, and work at the mission? Well, some wanted to work with the Spaniards, but many resisted. The Spanish soldiers would capture the men, many Indians and force them to work and live at the mission. Before the Spaniards came, Indians led a simple way of life. They lived off the, the land by hunting animals and gathering food like acorns. They wove baskets with reeds, made clothes from animal skins. The Spaniards taught Indians modern ways of living. They taught them how to grow crops and raise farm animals. Honey, you're a boy, make a big noise, playing in the street. Gonna be a big man someday, you got mud on your face, you big disgrace. Kicking your can all over the place Singing we will, we will rock you We will, we will rock you The missions were built to convert Indians and others into Catholics almost 50 years to the day after the landing of Christopher Columbus in the Western Hemisphere. When the Spanish explorers got here, they met the Chumash Indians. The Chumash people were not farmers. The Chumash men were hunters, and the Chumash women were gatherers. Every Chumash village had at least one shaman and one chief. I thought the mission was hard. Regimes were so harsh that some Indians were angry at their lack of freedom. 
Some tried to escape, and they got punished badly by the soldiers. On the other hand, some Chumash people did, were happy that they didn't have to worry about their survival. There were some troubles at this mission as well. In 1812, an earthquake damaged the mission. Another problem they learned to endure was when the Chumash began to fall ill. They caught the diseases that the Spanish had. They That decreased the Chumash population. As you can see, the same generic talking points seem to keep coming up. The Indians lived a simple life. They didn't farm anything. The Spanish came to convert them to Catholicism. Indians died from European diseases. While there is some truth to this, it completely negates Nikitlaka culture and achievements and glosses over the true horror that the Spaniards wrought with their missionization system. The missions were not some idyllic setting of pastoral peace, which writers like Helen Hunt Jackson have mythologized, but were more akin to concentration camps where our ancestors were literally worked to death for the benefit of Spanish colonists and priests. What approach would children learning about the concentration camps during the Jewish Holocaust be given? Would they make an Auschwitz model out of Legos or cake and then share it with the class? Would those who got sick and died in the camps be just a tragic accident or the victims of a calculated genocide? I think we all know the answer to that. Before discussing the tragic history of the Spanish mission system in California, let us take a minute to remember what was here before the European invasion began. According to various sources, there is archaeological evidence of a Nicatlaca presence in California dating back at least 13,000 years. But it is important to remember that many of the earlier sites are now below sea level due to the rising waters of the Pacific Ocean. At the time of the European contact, there were six major language families. Udo Aztecan, Pokin, Penutian, Ukayan, Athapaskan and Algic. Within these larger language families were a variety of smaller, distinct cultures that included various peoples with defined, understood hunting grounds and settlements such as the Tongva, the Chumash, and the Yokuts. However, this diversity should not be interpreted as our ancestors existing in isolated bubbles with no contact amongst each other as a past visit to the old Hohokam settlement of Pueblo Grande near Phoenix, Arizona showed me. At that site's museum, there's a wall map showing the huge trade routes that our people used and which connected our ancestors from one end of Anahuac to the other. Traceable items such as feathers, shells, and obsidian attest to this vigorous and vibrant trade. When the Spaniards set out to colonize the area of California in the late 1760s, Many sources state that the Nicatlaca population of California was roughly 300,000 people, a rather low estimate in my opinion. I say this because existing chronicles written by Europeans regarding the early years of the incursion are filled with references and descriptions of how populated the land along the coast was. And this was almost 250 years after the Spaniards had landed on the mainland of Anahuac, releasing diseases that cut a large swath of the people of this continent. By the 1770s, for example, Francisco Coronado and his army had waged war against our people in the areas of Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas. At the same time, fellow Spaniard Hernando de Soto was spreading disease and death throughout parts of Florida, Georgia, North and South Carolina, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, and Texas. In the early 1600s, Juan de Onate, son of a Spanish conquistador who partook in the conquest of Chalisco, followed in his father's footsteps and led an army of Spanish invaders into the area now known as New Mexico, where Franciscan missionaries set out converting the so-called Pueblo peoples. This experiment in coercive conversion continued for nearly 80 years before being temporarily expelled by Pope's revolt. So even if scholars' estimates of 300,000 people in the 1770s is correct, one must consider that this low number may be a direct result of European diseases unleashed on our people and transmitted by our ancestors following those vast and extensive trade routes. Direct European contact with our people 
living in California began with the voyages of Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo in 1542. Cabrillo was a man whose name many living here in California have heard, but few know his exploits in any, in, in any depth. On September 28, 1542, Cabrillo and his men sailed into the bay known as San Diego. Cabrillo's interaction with our people did not begin on this day, but goes back to the earliest days of the Spanish destruction of our civilizations. Cabrillo was appointed by none other than Hernan Cortez to head the group responsible for constructing and implementing the ships used to lay siege to the Mexica capital of Tenochtitlan, an act that led directly to the destruction of this beautiful city and the deaths of at least 200,000 men, women, and children. Following the destruction of Tenochtitlan, Cabrillo served as a captain under the command of Pedro de Alvarado in his destruction and colonization of the people of Guatemala and Honduras. As a seasoned veteran of the Spanish genocide in Mexico and Central America, and the indulgences and all the spoils and brutalities that went with it, Cabrillo and his men undoubtedly did their part in introducing numerous diseases to the people of California, both airborne and sexual. For these cruel acts of genocide and destruction, he is immortalized with various parks, beaches, and highways named after him, and his portrait even adorns a postage stamp, which I found and was actually one that was used. But perhaps the most outrageous of these insults is the fact that his name is glorified by at least two high schools in Southern California, including Cabrillo High School in Long Beach, schools undoubtedly attended by numerous students whose ancestors he ruthlessly helped to destroy. By most accounts, Europeans showed little interest in California following the Cabrillo expedition, exceptions being the encroachments of Englishman Francis Drake, who declared our land's new Albion in, seven, in 1579, and the Spaniard Sebastian Vizcano, who sailed along the coast in 1602. In fact, it was Vizcano who can be held accountable for Hispanicizing the landmarks of our ancestral lands, for he took it upon himself to name such areas as San Diego, San Pedro, Santa Barbara, and Monterey. This interesting, this disinterest in California by the Spanish began to change in the late 1760s with what they saw as the encroachment of Russia and England into their lands. An example of this is Fort Ross, which is located in Sonoma County. Fort Ross, Fort Ross was a Russian colony established to provide food for their Alaskan settlements to the north. The Russian colonizers of Fort Ross also brought with them members of the Aleut from the Alaskan Peninsula to hunt and harvest sea otters. To combat this European threat, the Spanish monarch directed Jose de Galvez to implement a plan to secure the Spanish claimed lands along the Pacific Ocean. In order to keep costs to a minimum, Galvez's plan was twofold. The colonization of California was to be accomplished using Spanish soldiers and colonists, in addition to friars from the Franciscan order. Here it is important that we make sure to put the whole missionization of California into its proper historical context. During the past 500 years, Europeans have used a number of institutions to colonize our land and our people. The Spaniards in particular have used a variety of systems, including encomienda, repartimiento, and hacienda. All three institutions were used to exploit Nicolaca labor for the benefit of European overlords. Wikipedia defines encomienda as a labor system that was employed by the Spanish crown during the Spanish colonization of the Americas. In the encomienda, the crown granted a person, usually a conquistador, a specified number of natives for whom they were to take responsibility. The receiver of the grant was to instruct the natives in the Spanish language and in the Catholic faith. In return, they could exact tribute from the natives in the form of labor, gold, and agricultural products. That was a quote. The Repartimiento was a colonial forced labor system imposed upon the indigenous population of Spanish America. The natives were forced to do low paid or unpaid labor for a certain number of weeks or months each year on Spanish owned farms, mines, workshops, and public projects. Like the encomienda system that preceded it, 
the repartimiento was not slavery and that the worker is not owned outright, being free in various respects other than in the dispensation of his or her labor, and the work was intermittent. It, however, created slavery-like conditions in certain areas, most notoriously in silver mines of the 16th century Peru. The hacienda system was particularly deceitful because it gave the illusion of freedom. In this system, people were hired for their labor, but the extension of credit by the hacienda owners kept the laborers in a cycle of continuous debt and therefore kept them tied to the hacienda. So I'm just going to read a quote to kind of maybe clarify that a little bit more. Uh, it says, uh, this is from Indians of California, the changing image. So thus, throughout Spanish colonial history, the Indians remained in a kind of twilight zone between freedom and slavery. Compulsion was applied under the law in carefully prescribed ways. The Indians were forced to perform the obligation as free men. To these institutions must be added the missionization system. Like those previously mentioned, the Spanish friars were put in charge of Hispanicizing the Nicatlaca people under their charge by teaching them Spanish language, customs, and religion. In return, the Spanish priests were allowed to exploit Nicatlaca labor for their and the church's benefit. Initially, the missions were to be self-sustaining organizations whose surplus food was to be used to help support the accompanying Spanish soldiers and colonists. In his book, Converting California, James Sandos writes, the primary purpose of the Franciscans in the missions was to mold good Christians. Their secondary aim was to mold as well a labor force to occupy the bottom social rung of the town each mission was to become. In his book, Indians of California, The Changing Image, James Rawls writes, religious conversion, however, was not the sole concern of the missionaries. The Franciscans also recognized that effective Christianization could not be separated from the larger process of acculturation. Their aim was to bring about a rapid and thoroughgoing transformation of the natives. The Indians were to be Hispanicized not only in religion, but also in social organization, language, dress, work habits, and virtually other, every other aspect of their lives. To bring about such fundamental changes, the Indians first had to be concentrated by force if necessary so that the missionaries could closely relegate their activities. And just for clarification, whenever I use the word Indians, it's usually a direct quote. So may, some may say that to compare the Spanish missionaries to Nazi concentration camps is a bit extreme, perhaps even unfair, but I disagree. From the beginning, the Spaniards practiced the colonial policy they called congregation, reduction. This policy is just as its name implies. Beginning in the 1550s, the Spaniards would enter into an area and forcibly relocate naked Laka people from surrounding settlements into a new concentrated area for the purpose of creating a larger pool from which to extract labor and tribute. This policy was used throughout so-called New Spain and was carried over to California. This is important to remember because many apologists for Spanish barbarity against our people try to defend the missionaries and their actions by saying that they were ignorant of the damage they were doing. Such Holocaust denial is ludicrous. The Spanish used the same system of missionization throughout Seminawak for over 200 years before implementing the same policy in California. And in other areas of our continent, the same results occurred. In their book, Indians, Franciscans, and Spanish Colonization, Robert Jackson and Edward Castillo write, that from the beginning, quote, the program of congregation brought large populations together in compact communities, contributing to a major problem of sanitation and water pollution. Moreover, the concentration of a large number of people living together in a specific space facilitated the spread of disease. In many of the missions, the mortality rate has been described as no less than horrific. When one studies the birth and death rolls kept at the missions, every year shows that more deaths than births occurred. According to some records, in the 1770s, roughly 65,000 Nikitlaka people lived in and around the mission zones. By 1830, only 17,000 remained, a population decrease of almost 74%. At Mission San Miguel, considered one of the healthier missions, 
the average life expectancy for newborn Nikitlaka children was 10.2 years of age. For those who insist that the Spanish fires did not knowingly contribute to the extermination of our people, consider the following quote from Mariano Payares, the fifth mission president. Quote, every thoughtful missionary has noted that while some Gentiles procreate easily and are healthy and robust, though errant in the wilds, as soon as they commit themselves to a sociable and Christian life, they become extremely feeble, lose weight, get sick, and die. This plague affects the women particularly, especially those who have recently become pregnant. I fear that in a few years hence, on seeing Alta California deserted and depopulated of its Indians within a century of its discovery and conquest by the Spaniards, it will be asked, where is the numerous heathen dome that used to populate it? The missionary priests baptized them, administered the sacraments to them, and buried them." End quote. This quote by the mission president clearly shows that he understood that the Spanish presence in our lands led directly to our ancestors' deaths, yet their policies of forced congregation and missionization did not end, but continued unabated. Some may ask, why didn't the Nikitlaka just leave? Short answer, they were not allowed to. And second, this was our land anyway. Once a person underwent the ceremony of baptism, they were not allowed to change their mind. This also applied to the children whose parents baptized them. If a person of Nikitlaka descent felt they could no longer bear the injustices of the mission system and tried to flee, they were hunted down and forcibly returned and punished. In addition, most baptisms were performed after only a week or so of instruction, obviously in the language the local Nikitlaka did not fully understand, yet their baptismal vows were binding for life. In this way, under the guise of conversion, a slave labor force concentrated in work camps was created. Finally, I want to mention one individual in particular whose hand in our ancestors' death is not only celebrated, but seemingly revered. Junipero Serra, the man in charge of founding and implementing the above mission system. At every mission today can be found a statue of Serra, usually standing with a half-naked Nikitlaka child. At the National Statutory Hall in Washington, D.C., each state of the U.S. is represented by two statues, with those of Ronald Reagan and Junipero Serra representing California. The first time I saw such a statue, I was shocked by the audacity of those responsible for such a reprehensible symbol. Would anyone tolerate a statue of Hitler hugging or guiding a young Jewish boy with side locks and a yarmulke to a bright new future? Of course not. Yet this figure is recreated numerous times and is obviously condoned by the Catholic Church because there is currently a movement to have Sarah recognized as a saint. While I am not, while I am not certain what the religious criteria are for sainthood or what a saint is supposed to represent, I doubt that a man whose will to convert the people of California at any cost really qualifies. Lastly, some of the books I have read for my project try to end by giving a little uplift to the whole missionization disaster by asking the rhetorical question, did the Spanish really succeed in converting the Nikitlaka of California? Unfortunately, in my opinion, the answer is yes. How else would you explain that people who would send their children to schools whose names are taken directly from their history of enslavement and the people who enslaved them? When Europeans invaded our lands, not only did they take it upon themselves to rename geographical landmarks, but they also took it upon themselves to rename and redefine the people living here. Whenever a Spanish mission was founded, the Nikitlaka living in that area were collectively given a new name related to that mission. In this way, the Tongva became known as the Gabrielinos after Mission San Gabriel. Likewise, the Hachiman people became known as the Juanenos. The Ipai became known as the, the Dianguenos, etc. These new European definitions are still used to this day. I'm going to show you this example that I have here. As part of my documentary, uh, I went to basically all the missions uh, over the last couple of years. And at one in particular, I found this, uh, this van. And on the van, it had a couple stickers that said, full blood to the bone. And then next to it was a Juanenio. Here is a person showing Nikitlaka pride, but referring to themselves with this false European-imposed identity. But why is this important? 
A few years back, while researching the term La Raza Cosmica, I came across a disturbing quote by the book's author, Jose Vasconcelos. Quote, even the pure Indians are Hispanicized. They are Latinized, just as the environment itself is Latinized, end quote. This quote really hit me. Since then, I have come to understand that the process of reclaiming our identity goes hand in hand with also reclaiming our land, a process that is both physical and psychological. Part of this reclamation process requires us as Nikit Laka people to start looking past the European names given to our lands and to our people. In this way, I created the following graphics using a current map of California cities and towns and superimposed what is known as the Krober map, which delineated the existing boundaries of the Nikit Laka people in California at the time of the European invasion. In this way, those of us who live in cities such as LA, San Francisco, Sacramento, or even Palmdale and Bakersfield can now know whose land we are on. And for others, it can serve as a daily reminder of the lands their ancestors have stolen. Ideally, such maps can be made for every current state in Anahuac, and I encourage everyone to make one for whichever European occupied area of our land you find yourself living. Thank you for listening to my presentation today. My hope is that a project like this will lead to a redefining of the Spanish missions in California from the pastoral and peaceful lie they are presented as now to the work concentration camps they really were. Thank you.